good shepherds watch the sky suddenly the dark gives way to light the angel speaks the messiah why we've gathered here this morning is to worship the king and as we do that just a quick reminder as we get started to fill out that friendship register at some point during the service this morning and remember we're focusing on three things this advent season christ's first coming his birth what he accomplished here on earth while he was here what he came for and then we're waiting expectantly for his return i invite you to stand and join us if you're able as we sing together Like a fan. 
told the shepherds today in the city of David there has been born for you a savior who is Christ the Lord and Paul later wrote it's a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners like you and me among who I am the foremost of all let's praise him for that this morning there is no other God like you we sing the praises that you're to Jesus you have saved us there is no other god who reigns you are the name above all names jesus you have saved us shout for joy
Christ, the newborn King. Our God is with us, even now His love is here. So come and worship, worship Christ, the newborn King. God is with us, even now His love love is here. means God with us. God came to save sinners. Amen. We're all sinners. I'm a sinner. I know my own sin. You know your sin. We're all in need of a savior. It's a great gift that the Lord came to this earth. But again, he didn't just come to come. He came for a purpose. That's what we're about to sing about. That Christ came to go to the cross for our sins. You came down from heaven's throne, this earth you formed was not your home. A love like fell upon your face, a love like this the world had never known. On the altar of our praise, let there be no higher name than Jesus, Son of God. Down your perfect life, you are the sacrifice, oh Jesus, Son of God. You are Jesus, Son of God. You took our sin. You took our sin and you bore our shame, but you rose to life. Yes, you defeated the grave and the love like this, the world has never known. On the altar. Son of God, you are Jesus. 
consider that you came to this earth knowing full well that the reason for which you came was what we just sang about that you would die an excruciating death on a cross for my sake for the sake of the sins of the world Lord how you love us how you love us Lord we thank you that the work that you accomplished on that cross and through your resurrection from the grave that we have hope for eternal life with you in communion and fellowship with you for eternity. What a great gift. No gift that we'll receive in a couple weeks will come anywhere close. It's not even in the same category. The greatest gift we've ever received is you, Lord Jesus Christ, coming to this earth to die for me, a sinner. Lord, may we consider that. May we live that. And Lord, may we rejoice. It fills us with such joy to know that we get to be with you for eternity. Lord, we also thank you for an opportunity today to study your word together. What a great gift that is. 
So, Lord, we pray that you would open our ears and our eyes and our hearts to have understanding. Lord, that your word would move in power here this morning. I pray this in our Savior's name, Jesus Christ. Everybody said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. of scripture, lots of singing, a little bit of humor. It was good. My wife had a birthday uh, the day after Thanksgiving. So later on in the week, I, uh, after Sunday, I took her to, uh, just to get away for a while, a couple days. And while we were away, we went to uh, the theater to see a movie called The Man Who Invented Christmas. It's about Charles Dickens and how he wrote The Christmas Carol. We got there on time to watch the previews, and as we sat down in the prime seats, you know, three quarters of the way up, right dead middle, so nobody would block us, we found out that we were the only two in the whole theater of the whole movie. <laughs> I wasted a good makeout opportunity. But when I think of the man who uh, invented Christmas, I know that Charles Dickens had some good themes in that movie about a, a miserly, cranky old man named Ebenezer Scrooge who, who has a transformation by the end of the movie. The movie's filled with joy, especially at the end. It's about taking care of the poor at the end. It's about being generous. A lot of good themes in the movie, and yet he's not the one that invented Christmas, is he? In Luke chapters 1 and 2, we see that God's the one that invented Christmas. And I invite you to turn to Luke chapter 2, actually Luke chapter 1. I titled today's message, The Visit Between Two Specially Chosen Women. For the last two weeks, we've been following the activities of an angel. What's his name? Gabriel, meaning man of God. The biggest event, or maybe the second biggest event in history is about to take place. The birth of a son. When God became man. When deity took on humanity. And we have two related women, each going to bear a son and each going to bear a son in a miraculous way. Two weeks ago, we saw Gabriel announcing to an old priest that his wife, Elizabeth, would bear a son, whom they would name John. And John was going to be great. He was going to be filled with the Holy Spirit from the womb, and he'd turn many of the sons of Israel back to the Lord, it said in verse 16. He was going to be the promised forerunner of the Messiah, I call him the go-before because that's the term used in verse 17. But Zacharias, he doubted Gabriel's word, and so he was struck mute. Last week, we saw that God sent Gabriel to Nazareth in Galilee to a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to a man named Joseph who was from the lineage of David, King David. Mary was told that she was going to conceive, bear a son, and name him Jesus. That was in verse 31. Gabriel announced that Jesus would also be great. He would be called the son of the most high. That he would reign over the house of Jacob, or meaning Israel, forever. And his kingdom would have no end. When Mary was told by Gabriel that Elizabeth, in her old age, was already six months pregnant, she decided to go see this for herself. And so we come to what I'm calling the third act of the Christmas story. I titled this message, The Visit Between Two Specially Chosen Women. The third act of the Christmas story. So if you're in Luke chapter 1, 
looking at verse 39. If you don't have a Bible, please grab one of the seat in front of you. I want you to look at God's Word. It's on pages 43 and 44 to the right of the Bible, which is the New Testament. Verse 39. Now at this time, Mary arose and went in a hurry to the hill country to a city of Judah and entered the house of Zacharias and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the, be the baby leaped in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she cried out with a loud voice and said, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And how has it happened to me that the mother of my Lord would come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby leaped in my womb for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what had been spoken to her by the Lord. And Mary said, my soul exalts in the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God, my Savior. He has had regard for the humble state of his bond slave. For behold, from this time on, all generations will count me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is upon generation after generation towards those who fear him. He has done mighty deeds with his arm. He, he has scattered those who were proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones and has exalted those who were humble. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent away the rich empty-handed. He has given help to Israel, his servant, in remembrance of his mercy. As he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and his descendants forever. And Mary stayed with her about three months and then returned to her home. This is the third act of the Christmas story. As you can see, this act is mostly dialogue between these two specially chosen women. The narration here is very minor, just a few verses, 39 through 42, first part of 42, and then the very last verse, verse 56. The third act begins with Mary leaving Nazareth and ends with her return to Nazareth. So let's look at Mary visiting Elizabeth. Mary visited Elizabeth. What does Luke emphasize when you look at 39 and 40? Well, he emphasizes her swiftness of action. At this time, Mary arose and went in a hurry. The swiftness of her action. She arose, went in a hurry. She went in haste. Luke emphasizes her destination. She went to the hill country, to a town of Judah. This is a place where there's, they're country folk. They're not city folk. And Luke emphasizes her arrival and greeting. She entered the house of Zacharias and she greeted Elizabeth. That's what he emphasizes. Now, what does Luke leave out? Lots. He leaves out a whole lot. There's, there's like no detail of the journey. What route did she take? Doesn't tell us. So let's look at the map. <laughs> da, da. Here's Nazareth over here. Here is Judea or Judah, the land of Judah. This is the hill country. Now, all of this is called the Shephelah. It's called the hill country. So when you go from up here in the region of Galilee down to Jerusalem or Judah, most people do not take the straight road through the mountains. It's too long. It's too hard. So what they do is they go along the river and then come up into the hill country, or they go along the coastal plain and then come into the hill country. So what does Luke tell us the route Mary took? No idea. We don't know. He doesn't tell us. How long did the trip take? We don't know. How many miles was it? It's got to be between 60 and 70 miles. You can't do that in one day. Did she ride or did she walk? We don't know. Although all the Christmas pictures have Mary what? Riding that donkey, okay? So anyway, but did she ride or walk? By the way, would any family allow a single teenage daughter to travel by herself 65 miles? No. 
Does Luke tell us who her traveling companions are? No. He's leaving all those details out. Does he even tell us the name of the town in the hill country? Nope. Does he record the greeting? What words she said? Nope. She might have said something like, Shalom, the Lord is with you. We don't know exactly what she says. Luke leaves out a lot because these matters are not important. What is important is the dialogue between Elizabeth and Mary. And isn't that what he focuses on? It's all about what are they saying to one another. That's what God wants us to know. So let's look at the dialogue of these two women. It's the focus of this scene. In verse 41, we see that Elizabeth reacted to Mary's greeting. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb. So we see immediately she responded physically. She heard the greeting, whatever the words were, and the baby, meaning John, that's what they're going to name him, leaps in her womb. Now, as a man, I have no idea what this might be like. <laughs> I've had the privilege of feeling the, well, feeling the baby kick of my son, babies turn in the womb, they move in the womb, but here it says leap, I have no idea. Women, do you think you know what it means when a, woman, when a baby leaps in you? <laughs> Who said yeah? <laughs> Sally, come on up here and demonstrate what that would be like. <laughs> The baby leaps, and in verse 44, it said the baby leaped in her womb with joy. Leaped with joy. Now, this is, I find this amazing, right? Anyway, she responds physically. She also responded spiritually. She was filled with the Holy Spirit. Being filled with the Spirit before Pentecost, which is recorded in Acts chapter 2, was not common. In the Old Testament, the Spirit of the Lord only came upon certain people, like Moses in Numbers eleven seventeen, on some of the judges like Othniel, Gideon, Jephthah, and Samson, on some of the kings, the Spirit of the Lord came upon Saul, came upon David. In fact, here's one reference in 1 Samuel 16, verse 13. Samuel took the horn of oil, anointed him, meaning David, in the midst of his brothers, and the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from this, that day forward. And Samuel arose, went to Ramah, that's where he, he dwells, and now the Spirit of the Lord departed from who? Saul, and an evil spirit, this is kind of, this will change your theology a little bit, the evil spirit from who? From the Lord terrorized him. See, the spirit coming upon people in the Old Testament was rare. Was David fearful that he would lose the spirit? Yeah, after his sin with Bathsheba, this is what he writes in Psalm 51, 11. He says, do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. He knew because of his sin, his adulterous sin, that he might lose God's presence. He doesn't want the Spirit to leave him. The Spirit of the Lord coming upon people was rare before Pentecost. And yet here it's coming upon Elizabeth. And here the Spirit fills Elizabeth. And he fills her so she can speak this blessing over Mary. Notice the phrase, she cried out with a loud voice. Now, how far apart are these two women? Opens the door, greets, baby leaps. She's filled with the spirit. And she says, blessed are you. <laughs> you got the idea? They're, they're a foot apart. That was more than a foot. She's filled with the Spirit. She cries out with a loud voice. The divine voice is on her, and her words are these divinely inspired words. 
And Elizabeth replied to Mary's greeting. She pronounced three blessings. Blessed are you, Mary, that's you. Blessed are you among women. Among all women, Mary's the one that's found favor with God. Blessed are you. Secondly, blessed is the fruit of your womb, meaning who? The baby, the unborn, Jesus. Blessed is the fruit of your womb. Did Mary open the door and says, greeting, did you know I'm going to get pregnant? How did Elizabeth know she was carrying a child? Holy Spirit. Blesses the fruit of your womb. Elizabeth could only know, have that insight that Mary was pregnant because of the Holy Spirit. Blessed is that baby that you will bear. And look down at verse 45. Blessed is she who believed. Blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what had been spoken to her by the Lord through the angel Gabriel. That person is who? That's Mary. Blessed are you, Mary, because of your faith. You believed that God would honor his word. Three blessings. And then Elizabeth ponders over one question in verse 43. Here's the question. How has it happened to me that the mother of my Lord would come to me? How has it happened that you would come to me? Other translations have it like this. Why is this granted to me? Or why am I so favored that you have come to me? She's full of amazement that Mary has come. And I find really amazing she calls Mary the mother of Elizabeth's Lord. Right? The mother of my Lord. He's not even born yet. I think she just conceived, right? When the Gabriel left and as she's making her way, she's now conceived by the Holy Spirit. And so she's pregnant. I don't even know if Mary knew she was pregnant by the time she's going down there. But she is pregnant and Elizabeth says, Mary, you are the mother of my Lord. 27 times in chapters 1 and 2 of Luke, it uses the term Lord to refer to God. Here, Elizabeth recognizes Mary's unborn baby is going to be one day her Messiah, her Lord. Jumping ahead in Luke chapter 2, verse 11, we already had it on the screen during the singing part, but here's the angel speaking to the shepherds saying, For today in the city of David there has been born for you a Savior who is what? Who is Christ, but Christ really means Messiah, who is Messiah, the Lord. Here, Elizabeth is saying, Mary, you're the mother of my Lord. You're carrying the Messiah. And the proof that Mary was carrying the Son of the Most High was this movement of John inside Elizabeth's womb. He leapt for joy. Isn't it amazing that Two pregnant women standing next to each other, and somehow the baby in Elizabeth, who's only six months in the, you know, in, the, in the growing stage, recognizes the Messiah, the forerunner. He's the forerunner. And he leaps for joy. In Luke chapter 1, verse 6, it talked about Zacharias and Elizabeth were righteous in the sight of God. Elizabeth is a pretty amazing woman. She's carrying in her womb a very important son, correct? John. He's going to be great. He's going to turn many of the sons of Israel back to the Lord their God. He's going to be the forerunner of the Messiah. Elizabeth is carrying an individual who's going to be great. And yet in all that she says, there's no hint of jealousy that Mary's baby is going to be far greater. She blesses Mary. She blesses Mary's son, Jesus. And how does Mary respond? She responds with a praise psalm for God. Many call this a magnificat. Magnificat. That comes from the Latin Vulgate. The verb 
Magnificat actually comes first in this statement. That's why they call it this. It means exalting or it magnifies. Now, a couple things to note, just in verses 46 through 55, the text nowhere says that Mary spoke after being filled with the Spirit. Elizabeth was being filled with the Spirit, and she spoke. That's not what it says here about her. She's not being filled with the Spirit and then speaking. Therefore, this poem, this hymn, this psalm, was not one of those on-the-spot, Holy Spirit-inspired words. It's not like the Holy Spirit came upon her and then she spoke. It's very possible that she composed this psalm, this poem, as she was journeying to Elizabeth. Perhaps she was musing or thinking about Hannah's song of praise from 1 Samuel chapter 2. Look at these words from 1 Samuel chapter 2. Then Hannah prayed and said, My heart exalts in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth speaks boldly against my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. There is no one holy like the Lord. Indeed, there is no one one besides you, nor is there any rock like our God. Boast no more so very proudly. Do not let arrogance come out of your mouth, for the Lord is a God of knowledge, and with him actions are weighed. The bows of the mighty are shattered, but the feeble gird on strength. Those who, who were full hire themselves out for bread, but those who were hungry cease to hunger. Even the barren gives birth to seven, but she who has many children languishes. The Lord kills and makes alive. He brings down to Sheol and raises up. The Lord makes poor and rich. He brings low. He also exalts. He raises the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with nobles and inherit a seat of honor. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and he sets the world on them. He keeps the feet of his godly ones, but the wicked ones are silenced in darkness. For not by might shall a man prevail. Those who contend with the Lord will be shattered. And against them he will thunder in the heavens. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth, and he will give strength to his king and will exalt the horn of his anointed. There are so many similarities between 1 Samuel chapter 2 and what Hannah said, I mean, what Hannah said and what Mary says here in verses 46 and following. Let's look at Mary's praise song. First, Mary exalted the Lord for how he has blessed her. 46, it says, My soul exalts or magnifies the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. She exalts the Lord and rejoices in God her Savior. Does this mean that Mary needed a Savior? The answer is what? Yes. Was she a sinner just like you and I? You and me? What's the correct English? See, that was, I sinned right there by saying the wrong word. I missed the mark. Yeah, she needed a savior. She rejoices over the fact that God noticed her humility in verse 48. For he has regard, he's seen, he has regard for the humble state of his bond slave. For behold, from this time on, all generations will count me blessed. Is she to be worshipped? No, but you are to count her blessed. She rejoices over the fact that God took notice of her humility. By the way, does God see when you're humble? Yes. She rejoices over her role in bringing the Messiah into this world that future generations will call her blessed. In verse 49, she rejoices for the reason that God, the mighty one, has done great things for her. This is so rich in theology. God, Savior, God is the mighty one. And secondly, notice how Mary exalts the Lord for how he has blessed others. In verses 49 through 53, we can see in this section of her praise song, she focuses on three of God's attributes, his power, his holiness, and his mercy in verse 50. 
for the mighty one. He's powerful, has done great things for me. Holy is his name, his holiness and his mercy is upon generation after generation toward those who fear him. That's a quote from Psalm 103, verse 17. And then he goes into the mighty, the powerful deeds that he has done. And notice the reversals here. He scattered the proud. He brought down rulers. He exalts the humble. Now, do you think Mary's thinking of Israel's history, how God has humbled the proud? Very well. He could, she could also be thinking of world history. The proud Babylonians, did God bring them down? Yes. What about the Medes and the Persians? Yes. What about the kingdom of Greece? Yes. What about the Roman Empire? Will God bring that down? Yes. What about if America is proud? Oh, don't go there, pastor. He brings down the proud. Isn't there a verse somewhere where it says God is opposed to the proud but gives grace to the humble? Yes, there is. It's in James chapter 4, verse 6. Also, 1 Peter 5, 5. God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Is that a lesson we need to learn? individually is it easy for us to get prideful absolutely you want God to be opposing you be proud you want God's grace be humble verse 53 says God has filled the hungry and sent the rich away empty-handed aren't these the reversals very similar to first Samuel chapter 2 Mary exalts the Lord for how he has blessed her. Mary exalts the Lord for how he has blessed others. And now Mary exalts the Lord for how he has blessed Israel. See, God has given help to Israel. Notice he calls Israel his servant in remembrance of his mercy. When Mary was speaking these words, was Israel a godly people? Well, why would you send John the Baptist then, who needs to turn the people of Israel back to the Lord, their God? Were they religious people? Absolutely they were religious, but they weren't righteous. They had religion, but they weren't righteous. That's why the Messiah had to come. But let me ask you, will God ever abandon Israel? Will God ever not remember her with mercy? Is Israel still God's servant? Well, it all depends on whether you think the covenant that God made to Abraham was an everlasting covenant or whether it was a conditional covenant. What do you think, conditional or unconditional? It was unconditional. God will never abandon Israel. He will not ever stop remembering her with mercy because he chose her when he chose Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He chose him to love them and for them to be his people. In Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 7 and 8, Moses wrote, the Lord, Yahweh, he did not set his love on you nor choose you because you were more in number than all, any of the peoples, for you were the fewest of all peoples. But because the Lord loved you and kept the oath which he swore to your forefathers. Why does God love Israel? He made an oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to love Israel. And that's why the Lord brought you out by a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. God did not give Israel the land because of their righteousness. Do you, you know that? He didn't give it to them because of their righteousness, but because of the oath that he made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. In Deuteronomy chapter 9, verses 5 and 6, it says this. It is not for your righteousness or for the uprightness of your heart that you're going to possess their land, but it is because of the wickedness of those nations that the Lord your God is driving them out before you in order to confirm the oath which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Know then, it is not because of your righteousness that the Lord your God is giving you the good land to possess, for you are a stubborn people. Does God know Israel? 
It's not because they're righteous that they're given the land, but it's given to them because of an oath that God made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I'm sometimes asked, do I support Israel? My answer is yes. Well, why? Because in Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, when God's making that covenant with Abraham, he says, I will bless those who bless you. And the ones who curses you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Does that mean that I think that Israel is always righteous in what they do? No. Do they do some horrible things sometimes? Yes. Then why do you support them? Because God promises to bless those who bless them and curses those who curse them. And in Abraham, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Do you realize I have salvation now, today? I have a relationship with God, the Father, today, only because of what God promised to Abraham? That in him, in his seed, all the families of the earth will be blessed. I praise the Lord that through faith in Israel's Messiah, in Jesus, we can become the people of God and we can become part of God's family. And Mary closes her praise song by stating, God spoke to our fathers, meaning Israel's fathers. He spoke to Abraham and to his descendants for a certain period of time. Now, what's the word say? Spoke to them for ever. And the third act ends with Mary returned home in verse 56. Again, the narrator, Luke, gives us very little detail. Mary stayed with her about three months. Well, Elizabeth was six months pregnant when Mary got there, and she stays three months. Elizabeth's about ready to give birth, right? Did Mary stay for the birth? Well, how do you know? We just don't know. The text doesn't tell us one way or the other. But because next week we're going to be looking at Elizabeth giving birth, and Mary's nowhere in the picture, the assumption is that she left before Elizabeth gave birth. This is a fantastic account of two special women, isn't it? God chose these women to bear sons because God's about to usher in his redemptive plan, his plan of salvation. Now, was Elizabeth's job and Mary's job over once they gave birth? No, now the hard work begins. Their job wasn't over at childbirth. It was just the beginning. They were to care for, they were to nurture, they were to raise their boys in the ways of the Lord. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 7, it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord, Yahweh is our God, and Yahweh is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. These words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart, and you shall teach them diligently to your sons, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up. Their job as mothers is to teach their boys all about the ways of the Lord. Amen? Do you think after Zacharias gets this prophecy that John's going to be in the spirit and power of Elijah, you think they covered the Elijah story with him? Absolutely. Mothers, you have an important job. For Elizabeth, giving birth to John would take away her disgrace among men. Remember? It would take away her disgrace among men. For Mary, it's just the opposite. Giving birth to Jesus would bring disgrace upon herself from men, right? Because she wasn't married when she conceived. And it looks like to everybody she was bearing a child out of wedlock. 
Was Mary willing to go through that? Yes. Each of these women, they were each willing to be used by God for God's purposes and for God's glory. Reread this. This is rich in theology. Let's pray. Father, we look at these two women, Elizabeth and Mary. What faith each of them had. They trusted you. They knew that they were going to be vessels to bring into this world two mighty men. John, the forerunner of the Messiah, and Jesus, who is the Messiah. As we're looking at this Christmas story, Lord, help us to really understand what Christmas is all about. It's about you bringing redemption to man. Religion does not save. A relationship with Jesus Christ saves. Father, as we reread the Christmas story year after year, may it never become old for us. May you always show us new insight from your word. And as we get closer to the final two acts of the Christmas story, the birth of John and the birth of Jesus, we ask that you once again would show us in detail the true meaning of Christmas. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. We introduced a new song to you last week, you might recall, Come Now Long Expected Jesus. And as I mentioned then, we're going to uh, sing this song every week here of Advent. I think it does a great job of uh, sort of tying together these ideas of Christ's first coming and then being expectant for his return. So as we close, I invite you to stand and join us if you're able. Changing everything Call me to your
Christmas, not only that we celebrate his first coming, but that we look forward to his return, truly look forward to it. Thanks so much for being with us this weekend. Just a couple quick reminders as you leave. If you're a member or a regular attender and you'd like to contribute to the offering, there are boxes at the doorways to do that. If this is your first time with us, if you're visiting, uh, you're under no obligation to give to that. We're just glad you're here. But if you do have questions about the church or you just want to meet some people, come to the welcome counter here. Uh, out in the commons, and we'd love to meet you, get to know your names, give you information about the church, as well as a free gift as well. So we'd love for you to join us. Also, just so you're thinking about it, as we uh, are just a couple of weeks away from Christmas, we will be having normal services on Christmas Eve at 9 and 10.30. Those will be just, just like these services, normal services. And then Christmas Eve night, we're going to have a more traditional kind of carol uh, singing and, and reflection time and a, and a devotional there as well. That'll be at 6.30 on Christmas Eve, so you're welcome to that as well. Have a great week. We'll see you next week.